Today's reading is from 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 to 21. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people, Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise you up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son." When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family, that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant, and this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, Sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you, Marjorie. Do turn to the person next to you and share something that leapt out from that reading. What was that? Can you grab me the, um... Awesome. 
Sounds like great conversation going on. So um, bless you. Do carry on those conversations uh, afterwards. Um, and let me pray as we jump into uh, God's uh, word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reading. We thank you for um, what you teach through it. We ask that you would bless us now with such humility that we would hear from you. We pray that you would speak, Lord, um, for we are listening. Amen. Ko te mihi tuatahi ki te atua, nā nā ngā mea katoa e hanga. Uh, ko te atua, ko ihu karaiti, ko wairua tapu te maunga, ko wharikarakia uh, toku uh, waka, uh, ko um, rangateratanga i te atua toku awa. Uh, ko David uh, toku papa no Ingarangi ia, ko uh, Pixie Paris toku mama no America ia, uh, ko Billy Rowe toku wahane wera. Um, uh, ko uh, Phoebe Rato, ko uh, Leah, ko Abigail, Aku Tamariki, ko Caleb Toku Ingoa, Noreira Tena Kaito, Tena Kaito, Tena Kaito Katoa. We are looking at the Waka Papa of Jesus. We're into sermon number three. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's so good to journey through stories, isn't it? And to, to, to do that. And um, this morning, basically, over the, we, we split up the, the Whakapapa into three sections. Um, the uh, first basically being from Abraham down to David, then from David to um, uh, the exile, and then from the exile to Mary and Joseph. Um, and so uh, we're in this first section, and we've looked at Tamar last week. If you missed that, then do jump online and watch it, because it's a really... Um, Sorry? Rowdy. Rowdy sermon or story? Both. Yeah, that's right. It is. Um, uh, so check that out. Um, and uh, today we're looking at King David, as we've alluded to already. Um, what, I've, what I've discovered looking through David's story over the last couple of weeks, and you, and you can read this. It's actually a really good thing to do, to sit and read a big narrative. And it starts in 1 Kings chapter 16 and goes right to the end uh, of 1 Samuel chapter 16, goes to the end of 1 Samuel, then it's the whole of 2 Samuel, and then it's the beginning of um, 1 Kings. And then it's also repeated again in a slightly different way in 1 Chronicles um, from 9 or uh, well, 10 onwards. Um, and it is an amazing narrative. And it is amazing because David is amazing. And I've been astounded. There's some things that I picked up that I hadn't picked up before. Um, I've, I've read through the whole of David's narrative a few times, but, but sitting in the last two weeks, there's um, something that really stood out to me, and that's what I feel um, that God has invited me to share today. And that is that David has this incredible thing where he um, has really significant attachment and detachment to people and things. Okay, and he's really, it's really incredible the way you track that through. He's not a squeaky clean guy, and we all know that. We tend to think of David quite quickly. We go to his story with Bathsheba, but actually the vast majority of the time, he's a deeply holy man. Um, uh, but he does make mistakes, but he has just this thing leapt out at me. And what I mean by that is his attachment um, to people is actually beautiful. So he has this relationship with Jonathan, who's um, the king, Saul. He's, David's already been anointed king, but he gets to know um, the current king's um, son, Jonathan. And he has this deep, vulnerable relationship of love. I don't know if you've ever experienced that with somebody, where there's this kind of safety and connection and sharing of life with one another. It's astounding that he has it's a deep attachment with Jonathan. He actually has the same for a little bit with Michal, who's Saul's daughter. It doesn't always go well with them. Um, I imagine David's quite a feisty person, and Michal seems to be the same. Um, but he has, David has the same even with Saul, who tries to kill him. And then he also has this deep attachment to Bathsheba, which is really inappropriate, but um, ends up being blessed and ends up, if you follow the story all the way through, she ends up being a really healthy, wonderful woman actually becomes a spokesperson for him and is, um, is amazing in the, you know, when, you, when you track that through. He has this attachment to people, but his biggest and greatest attachment, um, which we see named of him right back at the beginning when he appears. So he appears um, uh, when he's anointed by Samuel, and we actually don't get to meet him properly. You get, he's off stage, and then when he comes on, he doesn't speak. You just get a description of him. He's ruddy and handsome, it says. He says he's got really attractive eyes. Um, and uh, um, what you hear in the second story is that um, he's actually a really good um, player of music. 
uh, and he's good at calming people down. Um, and then in the third story, you discover um, David himself. And we'll come to that story in a minute, which is the David and Goliath story we saw, um, we all played out earlier. But, but his uh, attachment is described as he is a man after God's heart. Yeah? That is amazing. Wouldn't you love for that to be said over you, that you're a woman after God's heart or a man after God's heart? This isn't just someone who liked God or did a lot of godly things. It's someone who pursues God. He's after God. Does that make sense? It's not after. It's not the term after as in comes first God and then it comes David. Yeah? That's not what after means in this. It means going after God. He's seeking him. That's what he's known for. And God sees that in him. He has a deep attachment to God. But what I also noticed, I'm just going to scribble these on the board because it helps me remember. So we have attachment. Is there a T again? Thank you. No T. Ah. Thanks. Uh, And detachment. He has an amazing detachment to significant moments that probably we don't detach from. Right? So when we see him first talking, he's actually arrived at the enemy lines and, and the, at the battlefront, and he's brought bread for his brothers. Okay? And so in comes this scrawny kid who's been a shepherd boy, and he discovers Goliath mocking God. And David just plows in and starts asking all the soldiers, what is this going on? Who is this guy? What, what, tell me what's going on here. Now, at that moment, his brothers spot him, and his brothers start squishing him and putting him down. Does anyone here have an older brother or sister? Yeah? Any of you are brothers, older brothers and sisters? Yeah? You, you know what I'm talking about here? About the, the squishing of the younger sibling piece? Yeah? Um, and when that squishing takes place for David, he brushes it off like it's water on a duck's back. It's incredible. They go, what are you doing here? Get back home to your sheep. And he says, I'm just asking questions. He probably went, I'm just asking questions. But still, he moves on really quickly to finding out. He doesn't care what his brothers think of him. And then he goes into the tent with King Saul. Now, King Saul is the tallest man in the land. That's why he should have fought Goliath. Did you ever catch that? It describes Saul as head and shoulders above every other man. So who's the tallest man in Israel? Saul. Who should be fighting Goliath? Saul. But Saul is afraid. And he's crippled with it. Because he has an attachment to fear. Are you with me? But David is detached to this type of fear. He stands there in the presence of the king of the nation and just talks confidently. No, I've got this. Are you with me? Yeah? Anybody here get nervous talking to somebody who's important? Yeah, he doesn't. He's detached from that. Saul puts on his armor on top of him, and it's huge on David. And, and David goes, I can't even move. So he just takes it off. He's got a detachment to those things. I just let me use my sling and my stone. He's free from caring what people think of him, and he's free from fear in the face of danger. He's detached. Isn't that amazing? You then see this play out at a deeper level. What happens is Saul tries to kill David. He tries to kill him because he's jealous of him and because he's attached to fear. And what he does is there's this couple couple of moments where um, David literally is this close to Saul and Saul doesn't know that David's there and David could kill him. But he doesn't. Saul at that point in time is ruining David's life. David has had to leave everything he's ever known and is on the run. He literally, there's points where it describes he's running around the other side of the mountain as Saul and his men are coming the other side. He is... He should be attached to fear. And the way to solve it is, let's kill Saul. Everyone thinks I'm amazing because I used to be the general of all the armies and they'll just proclaim me king. But he doesn't do that. He's detached to that, even though Saul wants him dead. It happens at an even deeper level when David has a son called Absalom who does the same thing as Saul. Absalom causes civil war and cessation of David's king. And what happens is David is on the run. Again, he actually gets cleared out of his palace. David does this amazing thing where he decides if he stays here and Absalom comes, then people in Jerusalem will die. So I will leave so that none of my people will die. And I'll leave my home. He's detached to being king. 
and he runs, he runs into a place of safety, not because he's afraid of Absalom, but he's afraid of what Absalom will do to the people. So he chooses that. Does that make sense? And then he's in the cave again, and, and, and then what happens is they have a battle, and his people who, who come around him fight back to Absalom, and he says to all of the officers, it says that he made sure that every single one of the officers knew, don't kill my son. The, the son who's taken his throne. The son who's sneakily, if you read it through, Absalom is evil, and he's conniving. And he's done it at David, at his own dad. Massive entitlement. It says that um, Absalom was as, as handsome as they, get, as they get. Okay? His hair apparently was beautiful. <laughs> it ends up, because he's attached to his hair, that his hair gets attached to a tree. And he gets caught. And gets killed. But when Absalom dies, David weeps. Same as he weeps when Saul dies. Because he's attached to people and not attached to revenge. The guy who kills Absalom, I was waiting. I I couldn't remember this bit in the story, as in what happened next. I was expecting that the guy who killed Absalom, that David was then going to kill him off. He had to say, you shouldn't have killed my son. I gave you a direct command. And that part never comes. Because he doesn't do revenge. Isn't that amazing? There's two other really clear moments that um, I want to land on. The first one um, is the one that we probably all know quite well, which is the Bathsheba one. And then the second one is the passage we've talked about here. But first of all, I just want to touch base on the Bathsheba one. So David, at the beginning of the Bathsheba narrative, stays at home, doesn't go out to war as all kings should do. This is the indication that something's going wrong. He's thinking about himself and not thinking about his nation. Yeah, He started being attached to his nice home. And he wanders up onto the top of his roof, and there is beautiful Bathsheba, bathing nakedly, and he's allowed that selfishness to color his mind, and it distorts him to a level where he takes another man's wife. And then because she gets pregnant, he then tries to cover it up by getting his, the Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to come home from battle, where David should be. That's another one of those, you know, Saul should have been fighting, and David went and fought. At that moment, David should have been fighting, but Uriah is fighting. He calls Uriah home, gets him drunk, tries to get him to sleep with his wife so that he can make it look like it's not his kid. And Uriah doesn't do that because he wants to be honorable and godly. And so David is, you know, caught up in his sin. And what he does in that moment is he's actually attached to it. He's attached to his fear that suddenly he's going to be found out. And what he does is he sends Uriah to the front line where the, where the battling is the hardest. And he tells the commander of the armies, go forward with Uriah there. And when Uriah's at the front, back off and let him be killed. That's because he's attached in this moment to his fear. But what happens is, is the baby is then born. And Nathan the prophet comes in to speak to David. And he tells him this amazing story about a poor farmer who has a little sheep, one sheep who he cares for, that even nurses himself and even sleeps in his bed with because he cares for this one thing. But this rich landowner who has hundreds and hundreds of sheep um, has a guest. And when the guest comes, this rich farmer wants to make a feast. And so he takes the poor man's ewe slaughters it and gives it to the guest. And David rages. He goes, tell me who this, this landowner is because I, you know, he should be killed for this. This is terrible that he's you know, doing this thing. And Nathan says these amazing words. He says, you are the man. Brave, brave eh? Really brave. And at that moment, we get to see what David is attached to. Is he attached to making sure that no one knows? Is he going to deny it? Is he going to kill off Nathan? Many kings do that with their prophets. He doesn't. He doesn't. He immediately goes into the tent of the Lord, onto his knees, and he writes Psalm 51, which I encourage you to go home and read. Because in that moment, he is detached from all of that muck. He's detached from his pride. He's not fighting for himself. He comes down and he says, sorry. And he says, create in me a clean heart. For against you only have I sinned, God, and done what is not pleasing in your eyes. 
Isn't that amazing? When you get called out, do you say sorry straight away? Any of you? You know? He seems to be detached from pride in a beautiful way. Here's the next one. This scene that we heard today. Now this story, the reason I chose it is because in the unfolding story of the Bible, this is, the, this is a key moment. In fact, some scholars talk about it as the height of the Deuteronomist history. So from Moses onwards. The reason why it's the height is it's this moment something happens which has an effect on the rest of the story. And this is what it is. There's two things. The first one is that we're told that there is a promised king in the line of David. Yeah? Who's the promised king? Jesus is suddenly in the story. Are you with me? Did you spot that? You might have missed today because sometimes we, don't, we miss, the, you know. The, but, but the promised king is coming. God says the promised king is coming. And actually it's going to be even better than you thought he was because it's not just going to be a king or a, or a leader sent from God. It's actually going to be God. He doesn't say that in this passage. You have to wait till he appears to get that. Actually Mary's the first one who hears that. But, um, but he's the promised king is coming. That, at this moment, messianic prophecy floods its way through Israel. Does that make sense? All the time, when everything disaster comes, promised king is coming. The next thing that occurs is he says, I won't take away my hesed, which is a Hebrew word which occurs 250 times in the Old Testament. It's a very key word, which we don't actually have a really good English translation of. In fact, when they translated the Bible into English in the 16th century, they had to come up with a word, which they used loving kindness. Usually it gets translated to mercy or unfailing love. Trying to grasp this piece that God says in this story, I will never stop loving you. No matter what you do, I will love you. He goes on to say it again in scripture. He says, if you muck up, if you cause carnage, I'll love you. If you do what I say and you want my blessings, I'll love you. If you go away and prostitute yourself to other idols, I will love you. Isn't that amazing? This is a forever, this is a God saying, no, this is in my hands. I've got this peace. In fact, that word forever comes up multiple times in this little passage. In verse 13, God says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He says in 16, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. Again in 16, your throne shall be established forever. And then David responds and he says, um, and you established your people Israel for yourself to be your people forever. And again in 24, as for the word that you've spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, confirm it forever. Thus your name will be magnified forever. May it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. The house of your servant will be blessed forever. Do you think something's being pointed out here? Yeah? Forever, that's right. It's again and again and again. This is a beautiful passage, and it's kind of a hinge moment in a fucker papa because it's saying Jesus is coming, yeah? And he's going to love you forever. That's the fact of this story. But the story is way more juicy. Don't know if you spotted this. Maybe you shared this with the person next to you. Maybe you didn't. What's happening here is David is desperately excited to build a temple. Really excited. Now, if we know David, he gets attached to ideas. Yeah? He's had this idea, Marlon, play on him, that he's even gone too far to talk to Nathan, who's his prophet, and said, shall I do this? And Nathan says, yeah, go ahead. So you can imagine David is up all night planning. He's probably got blueprints drawn out. He's probably listed, because he does this quite a lot, who's going to be in charge of what, and list all that. He's excited about that. And then what happens in the morning? God says no. How are you when you don't get what you want? Yeah? Yeah. You know, I, I road tested this sermon on my, um, my three-year-old this week. 
Um, so uh, I had a moment where I went to go pick up um, Leah, who's our three-year-old, from kindy. Um, Billy was away on two nights retreat, so I had all three kids. And um, I'd left Phoebe in the car because it was easiest to only take in two, you know, one child into that moment. She was watching Disney Plus because it just contained her. I had the baby on the hip. I come in and Leah decides in that moment that her best friend, who I've never met before, is called Izzy. And Izzy has to come over for a play date and a sleepover. Now, I have to inform her that I can't do a sleepover because, actually, um, I'm single parenting tonight and I find it hard enough for three children and four, particularly one that I don't know, is not going to work out. At which point, Leah displays what she doesn't tend to display as much as Phoebe does, which is a full pelt whale temper tantrum in the middle of kindy. Bang! There it's happening there. And every kindy um, kayakal just turns and looks away. You know, they're just like, she's yours now. You're here. You deal with this. She's screaming because Izzy, whoever Izzy is, is, is not allowed to come. She's not getting what she wants. Anyway, I take it. I sit down with her, and I've got Abigail sitting here, who's kind of a little bit amazed by Leah's attitude. And I, and I say to Leah, Leah, what's going on here is, you know, it, you're not getting what you want, and that's okay. What do we need to do when we don't get what we want? And this other friend, who's not Izzy, because actually I don't even know which one was Izzy in the room, but the other one, this other friend comes over and says, well, when I don't get what I want, I just be happy. And I thought, that, that is the truth, but I don't think you do do that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And anyway, I was just like, anyway, I came away from that moment, took the screaming child into the car and belted her in, you know, those moments. And, uh, um, uh, uh, and I, I thought, it's okay, she's just, le- she's just three, yeah? She's just learning how to deal with what you don't get what you want. Anyway, it turns out at quarter past one in the morning when all three of my children woke up and my wife's not there, and uh, um, I have to take the screaming baby who doesn't want me because I don't produce breast milk. And, um, and the, you know, the older child is then having a, a temper tantrum because she's wet herself and doesn't want to, wants to have a shower, and I say she can't have a shower because um, I don't want the baby to be up all, you know, all night. And Phoebe loses the plot, which actually means that then Abigail is awake for the next three hours hours. Now, about five minutes into that process, I lost the capacity to be nice. (laughs) Because what I wanted was uninterrupted sleep. Yeah? When we don't get what we want, what comes out? For many of us, it's all sorts of things. For me, it usually is a stirring of anger which I then have to kind of mute, because I don't want to scream at my kids. I don't want to wake the rest of the house up at quarter past one either. Do you know what I mean? But you know, you're in that moment. What do, you, what do I do with that? Anger occurs when our will is crossed. Yeah? Dallas Willard talks about the fact that it's close to pain. It's just a signal that something's not going well. But there are better signals. And there are better drivers than anger. In fact, Dallas Willard goes on to say that everything that you do with anger, you can do better without it. Yeah? I was reading Evagrius, who's a um, fourth century monk the other day, and he was talking about that desire provides fuel for anger. Now, desires are a good thing. Desires are a really good thing. God gives us desires. But if you dwell on desires and believe that they're the thing to call the shots... That's going to fuel your anger because you don't always get what you want. Does that make sense? Anger plays through the David story. Saul is an angry king, and he has to get David to come in and play the harp. Do you remember that story? Yeah? That's because Saul is trying to deal with his external circumstances. If you try to fix your external circumstances, you still are being driven by your desire. It only changes when you let your internal circumstances be transformed. And what we see in David is that for most of his upbringing, he spent it in solitude and silence with the sheep. Psalm 23 wasn't a divine God word poem that dropped into David's head. It came out of David's heart, of deep connection with God. If you, like me, struggle with your desires, you need to find a way to be detached from them. They're fine. They're just rubbish running your life. Does that make sense? Jesus is the best teacher on this that has ever lived. You have to see Jesus as an amazing teacher. Otherwise, you won't listen to what he says. No one has ever compared to Jesus' teaching. And what Jesus says to this is, if you want to follow me, 
You have to deny yourself to take up your cross and follow me. If you seek to get what you want, it's not going to go well. Yeah? But if you deny yourself, take up your cross, that means that you're okay with not getting what you want, whatever that is. You can want those things. You don't have to suppress your anger that way. Suddenly your anger isn't so much of an issue because it's okay that I don't get sleep. You know? This is deep work. But David shows us that it's possible. It's possible because he's attached to God. Does that make sense? The more you're attached to God, the more you can be detached to everything else that doesn't actually help. Shall we pray? Holy Spirit, would you come? We're a people who have um, ways that are not your ways and thoughts that are not your thoughts. And we need your transforming grace. Love the words of that song, Lord, that says that your grace that draws us near. We need to be near to you. We need an attachment to you. Would you come and move in this moment? As we share in communion together and with you, would you work deeply in our hearts? Or would you give us a hunger to let go of all of our other attachments? That we would be attached solely to you. In Jesus' name, amen.